Olio was really what he would use to introduce himself to a college or to introduce himself to a job site. And as those flipped cameras became more um, prominent, we would start recording um, interviews or authentic learning with these students with their portfolios. And you understand, many of the students that we work with, they can't, they can't look at themselves initially when, you know, when they have to watch themselves in videotape. They just can't. So that was our baseline. The student is lacking confidence of looking at himself. He's not sure how to express his strengths and needs or desires or wishes or hopes. He can't do it. But that was our baseline. About every six weeks, we would re-record him working with his portfolio, and you would see the change of confidence within that young man or that young woman as we kept repeating and repeating and repeating. Tell me about yourself, John. What was, it, what was some of the greatest successes you had, whether it's at home or in school? And you would talk about that. Initially, it was horrible. And we all agreed it was horrible. But after two years of that, and that was in his IEP incident, it was self-determination. The goal was he would be able to express whatever his wants, needs, desires, or hopes, whatever it might be, in a confident, self-assured manner. That was the goal. And then we created the objectives, and the measurements was the videotaping. Now, there was substantial IEP planning, but more importantly, the student was at the meeting, and the teacher was leading the discussion. So if you think, here's the other part. When your son or daughter leaves school and goes for a job interview, mom and dad stay in the car. When your son or daughter goes to college and has to talk to the college counselor or to the intake person or it might be, mom and dad need to stay in the car. Now that's alien to a lot of us because we've always been there with them. But who does the college want to talk to? Who does the employer want to talk to? Who do they want to talk to? They want to talk to the young man sitting in front of them. They don't want to talk to mom or dad. And so when you think about self-determination or self-advocacy, it better be in the IEP. Because you want your school, and there's wonderful teachers and special ed that can do this, you want that there. You want evidence that your son or daughter can has a portfolio and can take it to whatever post school site that might be and talk about themselves. So that's where we have self-determination. Self Here's uh, supports and accommodations. Here's the heart. <coughs> now, for all these years in special ed, you've had the IEP. The IEP goes away, but your son or daughter still qualifies under um, the Disability Act of 1973. And I've given you an awful lot of information about that. In, have any of your students been on 504 plans? Okay, so you're aware. That's actually a pretty good vehicle for support. And because what happens with a 504 plan is the federal law around uh, adult disabilities. And the definition that these are under 504, the definition of major life activities includes but not limited to any of these areas of self. Um, of taking care of yourself or performing manual tasks, etc. These are all, and then the act was amended in 2008 and became law in January 2009. It even broadened it more that you can have a disability of eating, sleeping, walking, standing. It covers almost everything. Lifting, bending, communicating. You just need evidence that that condition exists. So again, you have an off, a great deal of information on 504. Why is that important? Because colleges are post-secondary sites with enough with needed documentation that you can secure by way of your IEP or mentologist in a minute, or by diagnostic assessments to show a condition of ADD or Asperger's or other conditions of <coughs> biological conditions or of those other life um, life conditions that are really holding a son or daughter or son or daughter back. How qualifies for support under 504. <coughs> Here's the scope of the law. Now, this is the legal responsibility. So what I did is I said, OK, under IDEA in 504 in the schools, you'll see everything the school is responsible for. And you'll have a handout that you can actually read. But this is what the school does. And then when you go to college, look at what the college is able to do, or is required to do. So now you're going to, co <laughs> you're going to go to college, and you have to identify what your um, disability might be. 
you have to identify the evaluations that support the fact that you have a disability. You have to do that as a student. The payment for evaluation is not no longer borne by the school, but it's by you. The IP or service plan is not required or even expected in college. Course selection and programming is all done by the student. And so when you think of self-determination again, think of everything the student's required to do just to get into the school. That's what he should be working on. I mean, that's part of, you know, ADD is something that I've learned over, you know, you're born with ADHD or ADD. It never goes away. I've worked with teachers who have ADHD, and you, you realize it's, you know, they, um, they're creative, um, energetic people who every so often will have to stop and self-correct themselves in a social situation, maybe, but they've learned to do that. And we would think of all the different other conditions that may interfere, interfere in one's life or the quality of one's life. But again, it's the student who has to make it known. So then what I did is, this is so much reading. If you're in, in the 504, this, in, in the, the act was again amended in 2009. Here are all the different requirements. The very last section it says, post-secondary schools that require current documentation and ignore prior disability evaluations data may run a fall with very liberal definition of disability under the 504 Act. The age of documentation, however, is still important consideration. The current functional impact of the disability is key to determine the need for accommodations. In other words, the college may say we need current documentation. Has anyone had a son or daughter that's graduated recently in an IEP? See, what your school is required to do, and we'll talk about this in a second, is it's called a summary of performance document. Has anyone heard of that? Summary of performance. Okay, we're going to talk about that. So, that summary of performance document may actually be uh, enough for the college to look at your son or daughter as needing accommodations in school. Colleges are under no obligation to identify or evaluate students. You need to do that. So when we talk about a portfolio, it's okay for this, you know, for your son to be able to say, your daughter to be able to say, you know, I do have, uh, I have been identified as having ADHD. I've, I've learned to um, live with that condition. Um, but more importantly, I, I've done fairly well with that condition, let's say. Um, how, um, if you, um we homeschool our children, and I have a, a daughter that has ADHD. So how soon does she need to be labeled so that, you know, what, you know. That's a good question. So here, so who identified your, your daughter to have ADHD to this point? Do you just believe that's her condition? Everybody you know. Oh, you, yeah, you probably know. Because yeah. your husband probably had it or something. I'm kidding. But <laughs> it's kind of a joke because my oh, grandmother had it. Right. But, um, but you know that. Okay, so then what I would say is, you're going to have to get a, a medical documentation for it. But you'll probably do it as he or she prepares to enter college. Because what you're saying is he may not need a lot of help or support, but if that help or support may be required, we're going to talk, have that conversation up front. You don't want to have it six weeks into the first term of college where the struggles are pretty significant. Do I have to have it like a year ahead of time, two years ahead of time? So here's, this is really good, too. See, here's the other part. You know, Schools now, special ed, the law changed where you don't need to have that special ed evaluation every three years. Are you familiar with that? Remember, in special, every three years your son or daughter is reevaluated, mm -hmm. where they would do the Wexler and they would do the Woodcock Johnson, you know, the same old stuff. Well, now you could have an IEP meeting and they can say, well, we're not going to do that anymore because the information over the past two assessment periods has been pretty consistent. So we no longer have to do the assessment. Now, the parent could say, all right, I agree with that. My son's 17 years old, he's tired of being assessed. So what happens now, is that information could be five years old, and all of a sudden now you're going to college, and you're saying is the college is going to look at the information and possibly saying, well, that's five year, that information's five years old. Do you have any current information that we can use? <coughs> now, because of how the law was rewritten in 2009, they may not be able to, to squirm out of it that easy. Because you can really make the case that your son or daughter has been determined to have a condition of, of, um, of a disability as defined by 504 
and it has been in, you know it has been documented for 13 years, but not in the last five years. You could say that, and they may have to accept it. But in your case, I would say get it done probably at the end of their junior year in school, maybe, and have you know a, a child psychiatrist do the DSM four, five, or whatever it's called now, and have the diagnostic done. But don't they, if she wants accommodations for ACT, SAT, Absolutely. she needs it prior to that. Good point. Good point. And a physician can do that.